Hi, everybody. I am here and you will, I will be joining by face soon. I'm running back and forth between my computer, uh, other computer, uh, trying to finish some scripts. So just bear with me. Hey, guys. Eric is here. So you got some of you have not seen him in person. So introduce yourself and maybe pick his brain right now. Hi, Eric. Thank you for joining Whoa. us. Hi, Eric. Gloria anything here. you need to ask him, please ask him. Hi, Gregory Stafford. Not anything. Christopher Seagrest. Hey, can Eric you hear me? Eric is here for the first spot. I think uh, Diane is just running a few minutes late. So we're gonna, she came Hi back there. from from a project. So um, we can take care of some housekeeping items. So while we have Eric here, any editing questions? He, he uh, posted a new video. He's really helping us out with this video training at home. Um, He's got a basic editing, not just the KineMaster, which is a free download, but um, a basic editing training and also editing with iMovie. So there are different hey. training videos at home. And Eric, I'll let you take over while you want to just kind of talk to these guys while they finally, while they have you. Okay, bear with me because I've done a lot of a lot of work with training, but very little live. Although I used to do a lot of live television, it was usually connected to a big truck. So how you doing, Mr. Eric? I'm all right. <laughs> Who's that? I only see the top of your head, man. You see me? Only see, there you go. Okay, good. Show me your show me your whole head there. All right. Is that a digital mask? There we go. No, come down. Say it, come down. Say it again. Yeah. Uh, What's your name? My name Gregory. Hi, right, Gregory. I had um, excuse me. I had downloaded the the Kim mask. Yeah. I downloaded it on my phone because I got an Android. Yeah. Okay, so um, the video shots, they were just, um, she, she was saying like 30 to 35 like little shots like off my phone. Like, yep. just, like, like just taking on. Um, hold um, it the other way. <laughs> just camera shots. Yeah, hold it the other way. My bad. Like this. No, no, no. Horizontally when you're doing video. I'm going to get, there you go. That's the way we want you to shoot video, all y'all. Hold it up there, show everybody. So with the video, with the video shots, you wanted me to take them like this? Yeah. Okay, okay. It's not, you know, it's not gonna explode or anything. I'm just trying to get you to shoot it in a professional manner. If we if we were, you know, in the lab, we'd be using cameras that shoot widescreen. We wouldn't be turning them on their side. You know what I mean? It's easy to do. I've done it. When you get in a hurry, you forget. But when you're shooting video, you want to turn it on its side and get 16 by 9. So with the 30 to 35 shots of um of taking video shots, like like how long do they have to be? Well, it depends on the action. I, I don't like to really give it a time, but I would say, you know, default 10 seconds. It depends. If you're let's say you're just getting a shot of somebody reaching in a close-up and grabbing a mouse. Well, after their hand comes into the frame and they do a little bit with the mouse, well, that shot's over. So it's hard to put it. But, you know, if I'm getting a wide shot that I don't know exactly how I'm going to use, I'm going to go at least 10 seconds, maybe maybe 15 or 20. But if there's a rooster in it that's, you know, part of the story and the rooster's long out of the shot, then I'm going to turn it off, you know. But in general, I would say at least 10 seconds. You got to pay attention what you're shooting, though. So... And you got to kind of picture what you're going to edit it together. And then that helps you know what you need and not say, well, I've got to get 30 shots at 10 seconds. Now, we want you to get what you need to edit. That's more important than rules. You know what I'm saying? Right. But roughly, it's about 30. But if you take and you do a sequence of, say, let's say you've got three elements in your, and you do five shots of each of these elements, Somebody making a mask, somebody, I don't know, you know, somebody going out in the backyard or, or uh, just watching TV. I, I can get five, six shots out of each one of those. So that's 15 shots right there. And then maybe, you know, I've got like shots of my neighborhood or whatever. Did that help out? Yeah, it, it, it helped out because, you know, I was trying to get more of an understanding of it. And I'm glad that you said that because I'm taking the, um, I'm doing I'm doing mine off of, off of the, the COVID nineteen thing, so I'm in the house really doing it. I'm not really going nowhere doing it. I'm I'm doing it based off my wife. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just taking little video shots of her. You know what I'm saying? Close so that's, that's so that's Everybody basically. Huh? There you go. 
So yeah, I'm doing it like that. I'm well, shooting my like husband. Hi, right, go ahead. I'm sorry. Hi, right, go ahead. Roya, go ahead. Um, I I am taking plenty of videos. Hold on, I'm sorry. Excuse me. If you guys introduce yourself, like say like I'm Roya, and explain to Eric which class you're in, because he's got so many videos coming in. And sure. for those of uh, you who just joined us well, while we're waiting yeah, for our guest, while we're waiting oh. for our guest, we are um, just kind of picking Eric's brain while we have him on camera. <laughs> I didn't tell you that, Eric. We're going to ambush oh, you. Oh, that's all right. But you a lot know, of people asking me I've questions. Now room. is the time, but we have multiple classes in this uh, Zoom because I wanted everybody in the department to take advantage. So when you identify yourself, say, hey, this is Roya. I'm in the field production class. So he knows which project you're working on and whatnot. Thank okay, you. Good. Uh, I'm Roya and I'm in production class. Uh, I have a question about, um, I'm using a DLSR Canon and um, I have lighting. I have two um, natural light uh, lighting, but I still get very small amount of uh, light. So I need to put it on ISO like uh, 12,000. So I want to know what ISO you recommend and why am I not getting enough? Well, that's, a, that's going to take some detail, but I suspect that there, there's a, if you look at, do this, look up the words exposure triangle. Oh, I have but, taken photo one and two. You understand that it's not just your ISO, it's your shutter yes. speed and your f-stop that are also affecting your exposure. Yeah, it's, well, I put it on the... Um, Basically, I put it in the most open aperture at uh, most of the times when I'm shooting video. What, what it doesn't your, let me less than four. What, and, what is your shutter speed set at? Um, I think it's uh, I think it's one thirtieth or one over okay. fifteen. In your ISO, you need. What, are you shooting in candlelight or something? I mean, that's no, no. It's just it's a. Uh, I have lighting that I purchased for my um, camera, and it's the it's the this natural light lamps that come with. Yeah, you shouldn't need such a high ISO with lighting. Twelve hundreds and more, and I know that makes our images very grainy. So. Um, I Are need a technique. 1,200? 1,200. 1,200, right? Not 12,000. 12,000, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. something's going on here. I'm going to have to arrange to chat with you at another time there. I can, I, something is not right in what you're saying. There. Yeah, basically I have problems with uh, metering when I'm shooting. Um, so it might be that uh, something I'm doing wrong, any setting, anything. I'll I'll plan for a time that we can we can chat and, yeah. and you can help me we'll with that. that. Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I didn't really want to. I got probably some people with some editing questions. I I didn't yeah. want to get too deep into cameras, but that something's not going. Something's not right there. So sure. Let me talk to you offline another time, though. I, I'll get with you on it. Who's Thank next? Thank you. I appreciate do you have any editing questions right now? Having trouble just getting their story out? Anybody else? Okay, well, listen, I can help you with your camera then if nobody else has any other questions while we're waiting for Diane. Uh, yes, um, I need to grab it. You have a Rebel? It's a Rebel. Uh, it's a Rebel 100. Uh, Two, I need two seconds to bring it. Well, yeah, okay. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to sort of see it and stuff, but yeah, yeah I guess we can uh, it so on the manual. Channel Rebel 100, and I used to meet, I have a digital meter that we purchased for photo two lesson class. Yeah, you don't, you don't need that. We can't do that. I, so one thing I did was I metered it perfectly for shooting a photo and then I put it in a uh, video shooting mode but it suddenly it it becomes it will change the exposure and here's why it doesn't use all of the sensor with a with a camera a lower end DSLR like that it's not going to use all the sensor it's it's only using part of it therefore it's not getting as much light so everything has to be bumped up so 
you, you know, it's not going to translate directly the exposure from taking a still picture on a Canon like that. Yes. Um, that's part, that's, if, if that's what, it doesn't make sense to you, that's why. Well, what I sensed Well, what thing, sorry about that. I adjusted, obviously, when I have to, I can open my aperture for as long, as much as the camera allows. So I opened it and it's 4F stop. It does, doesn't go further than that, which F4. will limit. Yeah, and then it limits my shutter speed. Um, well, that, okay. You need to put it on manual. It's on manual. Yeah, and it, it, it might. It, and then also look at what, what frame rate you're shooting and what resolution. The resolution won't matter too much, but that matters more for you know filling up your card but you want to shoot at least in 720 or 1080 you probably are um, 720 or 1080 i i'm yeah. taking and you want, you want to shoot, try 24 frames a second it'll look like 24 point or 23.999 uh you can i don't know if that camera shoots faster than that but all those things if you get those lined up and there's still an issue there you know let me i'll take a look with you Absolutely. But yeah, shooting video with those cameras is a good bit different than shooting stills. Yeah. Not entirely, but it's a, you know, there's some restrictions into how you want to do things. Yeah. I have to interrupt now. Thank you, Eric, for, for tap dancing there, but I know that you're like oh, no, a lot I of a lot of people miss seeing you. Well, I miss seeing a lot of people. <laughs> so <laughs> well, now Eric's there. there. Ask him the questions. <laughs> So um, thank you everybody for showing up. I love that we have like 24 participants. I think there are 30 students overall that I have this summer. So this is great that everyone but six showed up. I was just gonna have this workshop for the broadcast news class um, because Diane's uh, background, if you read it was, um, hold on, just, hold on, hold on, let me text her. She is in the waiting room, but I wanna talk to you guys before I bring her in. Um, I'm going to mute mine. So. Well, she's going to want to say hi to you, so you better oh, yeah, unmute. All right. Okay. E Eric and I both worked with Diane Roberts. She is a multimedia award-winning journalist. I'll say this again when I introduce her. Um, but even though most of her experience, she's done a lot of radio, too. So those of you who are here for radio class or have radio shows on the side, in-house interns, or you're doing TV and radio, pick her brain about everything. This is why I invited everybody, because she is a... Even though she's on camera a lot, she's on air, she has the experience of everything. She's worked with photographers like Eric. She's been a reporter and an anchor like me. She's, a, a, you know, she's, even though she doesn't shoot her video regularly, I don't think it's been a long time she's, since she's shot video, she still knows what to look for. She knows how to produce pieces. So, and she's done it on a commercial level and um, news level all sports, everything. So I really wanted to say, um, I'm gonna have in invite her <coughs> in soon, but before I invite her in, remember I text you guys, please come up with some questions to ask, okay? Really, especially you advanced students, I really wanted you guys here too, because this is like your last, your last classes. These broadcast mentors, you need to embrace them. Um, Google her, get her email. You, um, she'll be more than happy to, when you send her an email, I listen to your Zoom, um, workshop with Narisa at HCC, you know, and she'll give you advice. Broadcast mentors, when I was trying to get in the business, got me to the next level. They put me in contact with people who were hiring and all that. So please don't just sit there. I want to show you guys off. Ask some questions. Ask about her career. You know, you saw the videos. When you produced that piece about the, the, the girl shooting uh, 1,100 basketball shoots a day, you know, how did you get this? How do you get this shot? How does your photographer do this? Ask her questions. How did you get in the business? How did you go from TV to radio? Ask questions. I don't want it silent. Okay, guys? This is an active Zoom, okay? Okay. Okay, guys? Okay. okay. All right. Okay. And then also some housekeeping notes. Some housekeeping notes. Uh, some housekeeping notes here. A couple other housekeeping notes. I want you guys, whether you're in-house intern, you're in the advanced class broadcast news EFP. You need to check your canvas often, okay, for updates. Everything is under announcements. Eric's training videos are on there. For those of you who just joined us, Eric's training videos, he had, he had the Kinemaster, how to edit from home Kinemaster. There's also a basic training on just basic editing, and now he's added an iMovie. So for those of you who have 
you may have to like, it's weird, a weird situation now. You may have to just like sit and play the video and pause it and then do what you need to do to edit your piece. I know it's weird, I know it's hard, but this is the situation we're in right now. I can't open up the studios because, you know, there really is no vaccine yet. And we, we, are, we have a program where we're working in groups, touching all kinds of equipment. It's gonna be, it's gonna be psychotic, like wiping down everything and you miss a spot, that spot's gonna be the COVID spot. So this is the new normal for us, not to be cliche. And um, so just check Canvas, check those editing videos on HCC Hawk TV, check for all your class assignments. Also, advanced students, we are going to have a lighting workshop for advanced students, because that's something we would have had if we were meeting in person. A lighting workshop next week, Friday the 19th. It's mandatory for all advanced students. Others are welcome. So if you wanna go, just text me and I'll send you the Zoom invite. Like I know William Conway, you'll probably wanna go. So I know Christopher Seagrass may want to go. Um, just if it's, you're going to learn lighting. And Eric, I think you're going to go to the studio, right? You're gonna actually, he's going to actually go back by himself. He's going to go to the HCC studio. Oh, no, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't know if they would like that. I would like that. I thought you, I you asked for that. I, I was going to do it at my house because... Okay, okay, that's, then I just I, made something I, up in my mind. You know, Maybe I, I dreamt that. I've <laughs> hundreds of times, you know. I'm making assignments. I'm like, you go, you go to work. The rest of us will stay home. <laughs> no, but Eric wants to go back to the studio. He's yeah, like I've been bored there. It's like Chernobyl down there. It's... But long story short, um, because I don't, uh, we need to move on because our guest has checked in. I'm going to do a proper introduction. She's just sitting quietly and she looks like a student, but I'm going to do a proper <laughs> introduction. Lighting workshop is mandatory for all advanced students, okay? Because I need you guys to know some kind of lighting before you graduate. Okay, that, so mark your calendar. I'm gonna put a message in Canvas. It's gonna be next Friday, June 19th. And do we make a time, Eric? I'm gonna put it in, in the Canvas. I just don't know. What is it, three o'clock? Well, so mark your calendar now, advanced model. students. Anybody else who wants to benefit um, from that uh, lighting workshop, take advantage of it and join us on Zoom from home, okay? So we are here, we have all classes, all of our summer classes. We have broadcast news here, advanced uh, TV studio, advanced electronic field production, my in-house interns. I have radio students in here. I have electronic field production students. And I said broadcast news. So we have everybody who's taking summer classes in that, this program, minus a few. So thank you for joining us. I want to interview, introduce, because you probably can't I'm recognize Sorry, me. I'm rude eating, but I just got <laughs> home. And I know you guys will get over it because by time it's my turn to talk, I'll be done eating. Thank you. Please. Please. Yeah, I gave you some time. I, this is, that is Diane Roberts, everybody. See, she's just like us, just like Us Magazine. <laughs> They're just like us. Talk with your mouth. Yes, I'm going to brag on her a little bit. She is an award-winning broadcast journalist, multimedia. She does every single platform you can imagine. Started in news, but from news, she does radio. TV, commercial, and news, and sports. She does a little bit of everything. So this is why I thought this would be a good idea to invite everybody to this, not just the broadcast news, because like I said earlier, when I was prepping you guys, um, even though she's most of her work is on camera right now, she has her hand in everything. She works, she's been working with photographers, I hate to say it, just like us, for decades, right? <laughs> I hate saying decades, but it's- I worked with that photographer, Eric. <laughs> we're all, we're all dead. Between me, Diane, and Eric, we have like almost a century worth of experience. There's no reason for anyone to know that at <laughs> Well, I told you, you, you look like you're a college student right now. So Thanks. you guys don't be intimidated by, you know, the resume I sent, sent you, the write-up and all of the things she does, because she's really cool. She loves working with students. That's another thing on her resume. She works with students and speaks to students a lot. And she's also taken on a lot of interns and taken uh, you know, assistance under her wing to teach her the business. So like I said, if I'm gonna promote this again, anytime we meet with a broadcast mentor, you need to take note, Google and search their email, email her and say, hey, remember me from the Zoom because these broadcast mentors will teach you things that we cannot teach you in the classroom. They are out in the field working and they have contacts for entry level jobs. Okay, they're like your personal coaches. Mm -hmm. So please, I can't stress that enough. Um, so without further ado, I you know I'm gonna toss it, hand it over to Diane Roberts. 
Oh, wow. Multimedia uh, award winning broadcast journalist. Now she's just repeating herself. She's There's on no point. I'm just excited she's here. <laughs> Diane, take it away. <laughs> uh oh, we're frozen. We're frozen. Am I frozen? Emily, help me. I think I'm frozen. Hello? Hello? Emily, come here. I've been out for three hours, so I'm coming down. Okay, wait, hold on. Were we frozen right there? Did you guys hear everything she said? Because I didn't get it. Yeah. Yeah. I heard, yeah. I heard everything. Okay, I'm sorry. Not, I'm not important. But okay, anyway, keep going, keep going. so I'm so it might take me a couple seconds to get back to you. I mean to like really be here. Because I'm mad about not finding any disinfectant wipes, but whatever. We don't really need them. I have hand sanitizer. So, um, so I love working with students. Narice is right about that. I have been an internship coordinator at two different jobs I've had. Um, and actually, at both of them, I sort of just took over being internship coordinator because no one really did. Um, someone was nice to me when I was an intern. I interned at WSB Television in Atlanta, Georgia. That's where I graduated with a journalism degree with an emphasis in broadcast news. And uh, I, at the time I was living in Atlanta and, and working at WSB, interning at WSB, I was also working at WSB Radio. So I interned five days a week, Monday through Friday. And then I worked at the radio station on the weekends. So I was in that same building for seven days a week. <clears throat> then after I graduated, I was offered a job at the television station as a weekend nighttime assignment editor. So the assignment editor is the person who listens to the scanners, gets all the you know press releases and, uh, and knows about everything that's happening in the community and sends all the crews out. So here I am right out of college, weekend nighttime assignment editor, that was my job. But five days a week, now I was working in radio five days a week. So once again, back to working seven days a week in that same building. So I did that for about almost a year. It was like 10 or 11 months, I worked seven days a week. And I say that to you because at the time I was doing it, I was loving every minute of it. I wouldn't change a thing. And I learned so much. So when you're first starting out, do an internship. Back when I was an intern, you could only do one. Now, a lot of schools allow you to do more than one. So if you could do more than one internship, do it. And when you intern, please have an open mind because I only knew what I saw on TV as far as news. So you saw the anchors and the reporters. That's what I thought, you know, okay, oh, maybe I can do that. But once you get inside of a newsroom, especially as an intern, because you're there to learn. And most of the people there are going to be kind and want to help you teach. And you see all the different jobs. There's reporters, photographers, editors, writers. There are producers. There's a news director, assistant news director. In some places, there's a managing editor. Then there are the people who work in marketing, journalism, folks with journalism, in marketing. Um, so there are so many jobs that maybe you don't see when you watch the news or you don't know about and now um here we are all these many years later and there's all of this social media so uh, a lot of people can actually have a job working in social media doing news so there are so many avenues open to you i just encourage you to please um do an internship one or more <coughs> So I graduated from State University. My first job was in Des Moines, Iowa uh, in November. <clears throat> so I moved from Atlanta, Georgia to Des Moines, Iowa in November. I say that because it was winter time and it was apparently the coldest winter they'd had in 15 years Yay, for the girl coming from Georgia. And I was there for two years and eight months, which turned into three winters. So that was a shock to my body. It was also a little bit of a culture shock because Atlanta at the time was about 50% black. And then when I went to Iowa, to Des Moines, Iowa, the entire state was 97% white, the entire state. So that's 3% other over the whole state. I was lucky because I, was, I lived in the capital and there was, it was also a college there. It was a college town, Drake University. So there were more others 
in Des Moines than many other parts of, of Iowa. But when I lived there, I was the first African-American that many, many people I interviewed had ever met. I mean, I would be rich oh, wow. if I got a quarter for every time somebody said that to me. And they weren't saying it to be mean or rude. Um, I always tell people there are all different kinds of racism. I lived in the South where it's very overt. You know, they just don't like black people. And I don't say that like all Southerners. I'm making a generalization. But in the Midwest, it's out of true ignorance because they haven't met a lot of black people. So they don't know a lot about black people. And then I've lived in the, um, in the Northeast. So there it's very covert because they're the Northeast and they're hip and they're cool and they love all people, but there's a little bit of covert racism. So I've lived in a lot of different places and experienced it in a lot of different ways. I'm kind of jumping all over. So from Des Moines, Iowa, I, uh, where I was a general assignment reporter, I worked uh, weekends, I worked nights. Um, I was able to do some fill-in anchoring. I worked really early in the morning. <clears throat> from there, I ended up going to Columbia, South Carolina as a weekend uh, news anchor. <clears throat> Excuse me, three days a week, I was either a consumer reporter, that was for the first part of my tenure, and then I was a medical reporter for the last part of my tenure, or vice versa, I always get that mixed up. Um, so I worked there for two years for my the duration of my contract. Um, and then after that, I went to the Tampa Bay area of Florida, which is where I worked with Narisa's husband, Paul, and I worked with Eric at WFLA TV. Uh, when I first got there, I worked at WTOG Channel 44. And at the time I got there, it was a true independent station and there was no Fox, there was no CW or any of that. It was just the station with no affiliation. And I worked uh, Monday through Friday night side. I was the first African-American Monday through Friday night side anchor in the Tampa Bay area of Florida. And I'm very proud of that, um, really proud of that. I worked there two years. They did not renew my contract. I was devastated. Uh, I thought I was good at my job. I thought I related well to our viewers. And I had a general manager who said, and for years I could never say this because I thought it reflected on me. It reflects on them. But I had a general manager who said, well, you rely too much on the teleprompter and that's why we're not going to renew you. That's just garbage. That's an excuse. I would rather someone, I would rather people be a little bit more honest about why they don't renew you. There are, but this is a, this is a business where you are judged on things that you may not even know. So keep that in mind. Um, so then I was out of work for just a few months and then I got picked up at WFLA where I started out as a weekend morning anchor. And then I got to be a weekend nighttime anchor. And then for my entire time there, I got passed over, passed over, passed over. I never got any of the Monday through Friday jobs um, for whatever reason. And then eventually I left there and came to Washington, DC. I left, um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we can get into it or not, doesn't matter. But I left and I wasn't sure where I was gonna go or what I was going to do. Someone who had been a producer, an executive producer at Channel 8 was a news director in DC. And she said, well, if you wanna come up here, you could come up here and you can freelance for a month. So in the DC area and in a lot of big cities, freelancers are big. So stations love freelancers because they don't have to pay you benefits and they can use you or not use you at will, right? And when you're a freelancer, you can not work if you don't want to. If you want to go home for your mom's birthday, you can go home for your mom's birthday. If you want to go to Fiji or the beach or whatever, you can. So it goes both ways, but you don't get um, paid if you don't work or if, if you have a full-time staff job, you get you know, you get vacation days. So I said, okay, sure, I'll come up and I'll freelance. <clears throat> and, and, I and I thought I would do it for a month. And if I liked it, maybe I'd stay a little bit. And that was, and I don't normally tell people, but that was 20 years ago. And so I clearly liked the freelance life. And I love Washington, D.C. I had vacationed here a lot before moving here. So I knew I loved D.C., but I didn't know if I could live here. Um, in Florida, um, I loved so much about Florida. I loved being near the water. I loved being near professional sports. I loved being near what you guys now call the Strass Center. It used to be the Tampa Bay Performing Arts Center. I love, you know, Broadway shows. I love concerts. I love the arts. I mean, I love all of that. But DC provided all of that 
plus it was a little bit more multicultural. And I grew up as an Air Force brat. I'd never really um, experienced true racism until I was about in the seventh grade. So my, my somebody's feeling somebody's like, oh, can't talk. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, if you guys aren't, while Diane's talking, uh, sorry, Diane, um, if everyone can put their, uh, their microphone on mute, because I know sometimes people bust in my house and then they make noise and sometimes there's feedback. So, and then if you want to talk, you can obviously unmute, raise your hand so we can see who wants to talk. That was like mixed minus, just so you yeah, know what I, know I was what hearing. That was. That was like That's what that was. That's how it felt to me. <laughs> um, and I'm almost done. And so, um, so I got all of those things that I had in the Tampa Bay area, but multicultural town. And as an Air Force brat, I always liked being around people of different religions, different colors, different ethnicities from different countries. And um, so I think DC suits me a little more. I miss the Florida weather. I miss the Gulf of Mexico. I miss my beloved Pinellas County. How many Pinellas people, please? How many of you, any, are any of you from Pinellas County? That is shameful. They're, they're let me look on the next, let me look on the next page. Pinellas. Anybody Pinellas? Are you all Hillsboro people? Because they would go to St. Pete College if they were Pinellas, usually. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I work in Pinellas. Who said that? Thomas? I work, yeah. Yay, you get oh, credit. Oh, wait, Diane, Manny, <laughs> Manny, raise your hand. Where's Manny? Manny, raise your hand. He works in Pinellas because he got, he works, he takes video from the helicopter like Paul now. We got him a job. He hasn't even graduated yet. My gosh, what that's is, awesome. Do you take pictures Scott, of your foot? What is called, my helicopter? I just want to know if you your foot. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I want to know. So that's basically my career up to now in a nutshell. I mean, I could, I mean, I could talk more about sort of what I do or you can ask questions. Do you want me to talk about what I do, Nerissa, or what do you want me to do? Well, let me, let's pick your brain here, okay? So what, what we can do it, like I'll be uh, Oprah right now. So <laughs> I'll be Filipino Oprah. So what, what? <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have done that while you had your, your drink up. What, what is your day like? Like, what projects are you working on right now, currently? Right? So, because your day is crazy. I mean, it's different all the time. So, so that's the best thing about my life is that my, my life, I'm different every day. My, my week is different all of the time. There's one concept <laughs> now that I used to not have, but I started working at Voice of America as a news uh, update anchor uh, for their radio um, department <clears throat> at the end of January. And I work Monday mornings. I, my on time, I have my arrival time is 6 a.m. My first newscast is at 7 a.m. and I work until 2 p.m. And then I work Wednesday nights when I work 2.05 p.m. to 10.05 p.m. And then just recently, somebody had something going on. So I picked up a Sunday morning shift for just a month. So I work three days a week at Voice of America. I work from home. Right back there is where I work. Uh, my, this is my home office. And uh, that's a nice constant because a lot of people are not working during the pandemic. And I am. So that's really cool. If we were not in the pandemic, <clears throat> I might be doing storytelling for a church or a nonprofit. I've been hired by both. I've been hired by a company that matches artists with people who love art. That was, that was the company. And so I did videos for all of their artists. You know, I hired a photographer, I hired an editor, I hired a graphics person as, you know, the president and founder of Diane's Talking. That's one of the many things I do. And, you know, I, interviewed them, I put it all together, um, and it's beautiful work. I mean, I know I did it, but it is really beautiful. And um, I also worked with a church here in town, Augustana Lutheran Church. They just celebrated their 100th anniversary last year. So they hired me to interview some of their older um, parishioners and tell their stories so that those stories would be preserved forever uh, for this very, old church in downtown DC. What's interesting about Augustana Lutheran Church is the church sits right in the middle of a neighborhood that was all black, but the church was a Swedish church. So somewhere in the late 50s, early 60s, um, 
the people at that church realized they were missing an opportunity. And so they did something with that they called the One Mile Outreach. I think that's what it was called, One Mile Outreach, where they all the parishioners would walk within a mile radius of the church, knocking on doors to all of the Black people in the neighborhood to invite them to that church because they thought the church should be more inclusive. And that was back then. And so to this day, that church, like when I walked in that church, I was really sort of thrown for a loop because there were black people, white people, Hispanic people, old people, young people with families, gay couples, gay couples with kids. They, they had everything. And I personally, myself, find that churches are still one of the places where there's a lot of separatism, racial separatism. And so I thought, wow, this, so I was lucky that this is the church that asked me to tell their story because it was a story that was really lovely. So I interviewed, I believe it was five parishioners and then I interviewed their former pastor from the 80s during the AIDS epidemic. They were one of the first churches in Washington DC to do AIDS outreach. They did a panel for the AIDS quilt and this is back when people, and the pastor would go to the hospital and visit parishioners who, uh, were suffering from HIV AIDS, which that wasn't done back in the 80s. Um, and so I got to tell that story. So I, you know, ha that's so different from the art one. And I did as I worked with a nonprofit before uh, telling their story. I've also done um, media training for that nonprofit. I've done public speaking training for Navy EOD. That's um, explosive ordnance devices. So the guys who, the Navy, the Navy divers who go under the water and disarm bombs, who they can't stand public speaking, but they can disarm bombs at any place in time. Um, so I, I do that usually twice a year. I say usually because I usually go to San Diego once and I usually go to Virginia Beach once. But this year, of course, COVID-19, the San Diego trip got canceled. The Virginia Beach trip is supposed to be um, in July. I don't know if that's still happening. And I'm sometimes a sports reporter at the local CBS affiliate, which is a, um, a sister station to Channel 10 in Tampa. I do voiceover work. And when people hear voiceover work, I think they immediately think of oh, commercials or movie trailers, but there's so much, or, uh, or, or cartoons or something. Uh, anime voices, but there's so much more to voiceover work. I've done voiceover work. Actually, I've done, I've done some voiceover work for Moffitt. Um, medical voiceover work. I did an online training for a government entity. I've done voiceover work for a county uh, right outside of DC that hired someone I used to work with to do the video for their awards show. And I was the voice for I mean, that's just like, who does that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so I wanna say, so you guys hear all, everything that she's doing, these are all jobs that you guys could be doing. Mm -hmm. So what my question to you, Diane, is with all this different, you have your hands in all these different platforms and situations and this, the students, my students are learning how to do this now. Mm -hmm. To walk into a situation where I don't know these people at this church and I have to tell their story. I don't know these bomb making former Navy SEALs. I have to tell their story. I have to train them. I don't know anything about this sports team, but I better act like I know everything about it. And a lot of you guys, listen to me, are walking in this situation and I tell you, go out and get the story or get up, go out and shoot a promotional video for them. And you're like, I don't know anything about this. You're not supposed to know anything. About right. Diane doesn't usually know anything about any of these things. Right. You can do all of them. How do you do that? What is your advice to the students to walk in a job and say like, okay, I've got to be an expert at this pretty quick and just get the job done? So I am pretty sure, having never been in your class, I am pretty sure Narisa has said to you guys to be prepared. I'm pretty sure. So. <laughs> They're all nodding. <laughs> I mean, it sounds so silly. Be prepared, but Frickin' be prepared. I mean, uh, so for me, and by the way, I guess it's because of what's going on. I don't normally talk about race a lot. I, so I find myself, okay, here goes another example. But, but as an African-American person, and I'm sure those of you who are of color, and as a woman, I feel like I have to be better than somebody else because I'm judged differently. So I've never not worked hard. Like, I don't know how to not work 
give 110%. I don't know how to do that. I wish I did. I wish I could give 87%. But you I can fill out, but you can't. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do that. So I am, I'm always trying to be over-prepared if I can. I'm trying to find the angle or the part of the story that somebody else doesn't know so that my story is different than their story. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. So when I first came here and I worked at the Fox affiliate and then later I ended up working at the CBS affiliate, both of them working in the sports department, uh, most of the time covering the Washington NFL football team, but also all the, other, all the other sports teams in town, the professional, the college, the high school, all of the weekend warriors, all of it. But every Wednesday and Thursday in the NFL is called open locker rooms. So that's when reporters can go to the practice facilities of the teams, one buck place in Tampa, and here it's in Ashburn. The players have to be available to you, and you're probably gonna go and you're gonna, everyone, all the reporters, newspaper, radio, TV, you're gonna go in front of so-and-so's locker, go in front of so-and-so, and you're probably all gonna ask around the same questions, which, you know, here it's like Dallas and Washington. Oh, that's like the greatest rivalry ever, right? So you're gonna, probably going to ask all the questions about, you know, all the different matchups and the last time they played and who has the most Super Bowls and all these sort of different things. That's all great, but I want to know deeper than that. So generally what happens is every week, depending on the sport, um, the media relations department sends out information. They send out either a media guide or something that you can access online that tells you everything you need to know about everybody on the team, who's played together before, what their interests are. I mean, like everything. So I would pick maybe, you know, pick three things. So maybe the quarterback matchup, quarterback receiver matchup, maybe the, maybe the DBs, uh, and then pick, you know, one other thing. But then I'm going to be reading all those bios. Who's reading bios? That seems boring and has nothing to do with the game. That's what you're thinking. But I read all the bios. That's how I found out that there was a player, and I did a story on this, and I found pictures. There was a player who played for Washington football who, when he was in high school, he, I'm going to, this is so sweet. He wore a suit and tie to school every day and carried a briefcase every day. That was in his bio. Nobody else was asking him about that. And I didn't ask him in front of other people. I waited till everybody went on to the next person. Then I asked him about it. And then I got some pictures. And then I did that story. Now, don't you find that interesting? That there's a, now he's in the NFL. Why? Because he has a great work ethic. And how do I know he has a great work ethic? Oh, he wore a suit and tie to school every day and took a briefcase because he wanted to be taken seriously in high school. So, I mean, I can tell you, there are a lot of examples of that, but I'm not going to get that story if I'm not reading the bios that might seem boring or if I'm not listening. I sent, Narisa, did you send them the links that I sent you? Yeah, we watched the, the basketball player. Okay, the, the, so that uh, basketball story. I don't watch the videos, right? Because I, yeah. I messaged you and I texted <laughs> you. I was okay. Yes, yeah. Watch it and come up with some questions. So yes, they watched it. She's hard, isn't she? So that basketball one, <laughs> literally, I've covered the Maryland women's basketball team for years. The whole time I've been here, they won a national championship. I was there when they won. You know, they've been to the final four. I was at the final four in Tampa when they went. You know, so I know their coach. I know their media relations person. But they're not always telling you everything. They're not going to tell you, oh, here's a great story. Now they might think of something, but they're not, they're not there to tell you. They're not there to coddle you and give you a story. But I'm there at a practice. And I overhear, it happened to be the media relations person talking to somebody else about, oh yeah, you know, Taylor was here at seven this morning, of course, you know, making her thousand baskets or whatever. And I'm like, what? And so I went over and I asked some questions and I go, she what? So she, every day, again, work ethic, every day that there's not a game, she makes, not attempts, but makes a thousand baskets a day. And on game day, only 500. But I did some research because to me that sounded like a lot. It sounded unusual, but I didn't know. So I called um, the Washington Wizards, the NBA team. And I asked them, what do those guys do? And most of those guys do between two and 400 baskets a day. 
And then I just did some research online. And that's when I found out, of course, this was prior to Kobe Bryant's death, but that's when I found out Kobe Bryant was the closest thing to what Taylor did. Kobe did that kind of thing. But we all know Kobe Bryant's work ethic, right? What kind of work right. ethic he had. So then I realized, oh, this thing that I thought was cool, it is cool and it's unusual, male or female. So that wasn't a story someone gave to me. And that wasn't a story I found on a bio. That's a story I found because I listened. So you have to listen too. And, and another thing is because I covered them a lot, I'm there a lot. So they know me and they know what I'm about, you know, that I'm not going to screw them some way, that I'm not trying to get them or tell some negative, awful story. Not that I wouldn't if something negative and awful happened, but, you know, I'm there just to cover them. So when you have a relationship with people, that's another thing you can try to do. That's why you have reporters who break stories if they're the police reporter or, you know, the NFL reporter or the Pinellas County reporter or whatever the case may be. So if you can build relationships, that's really, really helpful. Are there any people here who are going to go into public relations or are you all like going to do news or sports or something? There, any public relation people? They don't know. They're, they're trying to figure out because I mean... Yeah. The public relations, you can do videos. The thing I want to say, because she talks about, Diane talks about news, everything she says can relate to whether you're shooting a promotional video for somebody. You're you should, you telling should, a story. If you're doing a, a, a training video for somebody, like a lot of you field production who want to be aspiring photographers, you know, what she's, the, what she's trying to say is whether it's news or you're doing a commercial video for somebody, you need to do your research. And your the research. thing about your generation, you can Google everything. Oh, yeah. When Diane, Eric, and I were in school, or you know, we had to call people, or we had encyclopedias. Encyclopedias aren't even, like, current. I mean, we had nothing current. So we had to call people or, like, look in the newspaper and then call. No email, nothing. So you guys, what she's saying, like, Become an Google. expert Google and prepare yourself. Whether just, you're doing like a, a a video for the pizza place for their website, you need to Google that website. And like she said, look at the bios, look at the about us, and find out interesting yes. things. She said, go above and beyond what's obvious. I always say, don't don't state the obvious. Give me something. Give me a little right. bit of the. Go obvious. deeper. Go deeper. And the, the one thing I want to say about now. about googling things is everything that you Google isn't true. So please remember that. So, when, so yes. So please just make sure it's a, a legitimate source. So if I'm if I'm looking for information about the Maryland women's basketball team, I'm going to go to their website. Now I might find newspaper articles about them, but I'm not going to you know Mary Jo Smith said on Twitter that they're the best team since 1942. I'm not going to believe Mary Lou Smith. I don't know that that's true, but if I read it on the Maryland women's basketball website. That, that's information I can take is true. I used to teach um, at the Connecticut School of Broadcasting here. And so I used to tell my students that all the time, like you cannot, I mean, I'm sure you know that, but I have to say it anyway. Like Wikipedia, you know, Wikipedia is great for a reference, but it's yeah. not good as a source. Does yeah. that make sense, the difference? Yes. You can so find the information, is, you can but you better the information, but you have to go um, find the information to be true somewhere else because people can get on there and edit anything. So, and they do, they make up things all the time about people they don't like. So I have another question. Let's talk about, and I'm going to, we're going to get to your questions, guys. I just want to get some stuff that I definitely want you to have take away from this, uh, zoom meeting with our broadcast mentor. Okay. Let's talk about you transitioning into the pandemic. Cause a lot of our students are like, this sucks for lack of better terms and they have to work from home, they have to edit at home, and even more so because they're students. So some of us, you know, gung-ho reporters will put ourselves out there, but they're having to do everything from home. How have you transitioned and survived working during the pandemic, and what is your advice to them when they get a little frustrated that they don't have access to the studio or our cameras that we have at HCC? So <laughs> I have two schools of thought on that because one of my jobs working for Voice of America, first of all, they're a government agency. It's a government run um, agency. So pretty much they're there. Uh, everyone who works at Voice of America is still working 
and everyone is working from home, except like the master control operators, they have to physically be there. But everyone's working from home because their IT people and their engineers worked, you know, they've got workarounds. So I'm lucky that everything I need for the most part to do my job, I have. Now it's been an evolution. So when we first started working from home, I would call in on my iPhone. I would have my um, headset in from, from my iPhone. And that's how I did the news. We do a five minute news from the top of the hour to five after. It's live every single hour, never taped. So, you know, we were all just, you know, from our phones because we had to die, literally call the studio and that's how it got connected. Then the engineers worked up something where we could call into the studio through Microsoft Teams. And I happen to have a professional mic at home, but they also gave me one before I left. And uh, I don't need it. Anyway, so I have a professional microphone they gave me. Plus, they gave me, I don't even know what it's called. It would be the equivalent of a receiver if it was on TV. But it, I plug my microphone into it and it and it into my computer. And then all of that goes to back to the studio through Microsoft Teams. So that's how we now do the the updates. So it's not just on your phone. So it doesn't sound like a phone call. So it sounded like a phone call for months, maybe a month. Now it sounds like a regular newscast for the most part. But what about actualities? So those are like parts of interviews that you use in radio or correspondent reports, which would be equivalent to a television package. So how do we use those? Well, for me, what a moment. So I have this external speaker. It's called a boom bottle. I don't, oh, I don't know why, but it is. So this is my external speaker. And basically I put this right up to the microphone and that's how I play the actualities or the correspondent reports. That's and, that's how, and there are a couple of other people who do the same thing from their homes. Now, about two weeks ago, they called me right after my update and they were like, Diane, I don't know what happened, but your whole update, it sounded like you were underwater. And I was like, what? So we still don't know. I was, I actually went down there yesterday for about an hour and I took all my setup and the, and the guy can't figure out what the problem is. So it's, you know, technology is intermittent, intermittently annoying. So sometimes I can use sound and sometimes I cannot. So those of us in the professional world are just as annoyed and frustrated at certain things during the pandemic as you guys are. Um, and editing, uh, trying to edit on your computer at home, you might not have the same memory that you would have if you were at school. So, you know, you can complain about it if you want, but you'll be left behind. Just Thank you. pack it up and move on. Because Thank there's you. there's 20 other people who are going to be like, what? I'll do it. So suck it up and move on. Suck it up and move on. Did you hear that? Make it happen, Rainmaker. Make it happen. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I'm your hype man. I'm your hype man. Right now. No, you actually, the, we, Eric and I are like, because we get these complaints where there's like, I can't do it. You have well, to make it happen, Rainmaker, or I love what you said. You're going to be left behind. Well, you're going to get an ass yeah. on the report. Because Find a workaround. It can be done. You, it can be done. You just have to make it happen. Find a workaround. I mean, and nobody likes excuses. That's the other thing. Don't get in a work situation where it turns into, like when you're in, in school, it's always like, oh, the dog ate my paper or my little sister threw up on my paper. What a stupid stuff like that you always hear. And then when you get older, it's things like, oh, my battery died on my computer or I didn't have enough memory. So I could, nobody cares. Nobody cares. So you, 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 you know, no excuses, please find a way. You might have to do something smaller or shorter or not as layered as you would like, right? But you have to get it done. Like I used to be very big on, like I, I cared so much and I still care so much about every word, every sentence, every paragraph. Like I am obsessive about it. And I had somebody say to me once, you know, that's great and we're glad that you care about all that, you know, but if you don't give your editor time to edit that, you know, workman, that craft work, that thing that you worked, it doesn't matter because if they don't have enough time and it misses slot, nobody hears those words you worked so hard on. So there has to be a balance between making it special and getting it done on time. 
So you don't get to go to a TV station for those of you who want to be reporters or photographers or editors. You don't get to go, oh, but I was working on it. I was just waiting for that piece of music to download because that was really going to make it so special. Who cares? Because it didn't make slot. So it's not special for anybody. So try to remember to, if there are deadlines, try to honor your deadlines in any way, shape or form you can. Yeah, that at school and professionally. Mm -hmm. So let's open up the questions to you guys because I know you guys have questions. I told you to come up with questions and some of you just naturally have questions. This is your chance to speak to somebody professional in so many fields. So whether it's a radio question, a video question, reporting, Roya. What is your question for Diane? Well, I prepared a few questions. Uh, I'll ask a couple of them. Um, one thing you, you mentioned. So other people can ask also, okay? Um, but Absolutely. I've got a couple. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I wondered was in Florida, especially Tampa, uh, if we had this like magic one to be employed by the best company, what would that be like? Do you have any opinion, any, any suggestion? Is this very good companies that people work harder to be in there? Uh, are you talking about for you students, are you saying, like, what would you do, Diane, if you went back? I'm not sure what the question. No, it's for us when we graduate. Like, yeah. I, I'm graduating next year. So I would say, by the way, I wear contacts, and sometimes things fall on my eye, and I lose my mind. Um, I would say. You think that you want to stay in Tampa, Roya, right? Yes, yes. So, okay. so best jobs in Tampa if you're just beginning, because Tampa's not a small city to, you know. Right, but what I would say is now more than ever, you can get a lot of entry level jobs at um, TV stations, radio stations, newspapers that you couldn't get 10, 15 years ago. You know, you would have to have had five years of work in the business before you could get a job at yes. Channel 8 or Channel 10 or the Tampa Bay Times or whatever. That That's not the case anymore. So. I can't tell you guys what is the best company, but what I can say is, I'm gonna go back to do your research. So you have to know what you want, okay? Do you wanna work for like, uh, do you wanna work for a sports team? Do you wanna work for a healthcare company? Do you wanna work for a Fortune 500 company? Do you wanna work for a TV station? You know, you have to sort of, it can't be that blanket like, oh, you have, I think you have to kind of decide what you would like Let's to do. And, and what I did when I lived there, before I left there, I, um, I wanted to do voiceover work. And I looked up all the companies that hired voiceover artists. And I got a, a resume reel together and, a, and my resume. And I went to all those places and dropped off stuff in their mailbox. I tried to make appointments. A couple of the times I had appointments. So that's something I wanted to do. I did the research. I found the places that did what I want to do. And then I reached out to them. So you have to know, I think you have to know a little bit what kind of what you'd like to do. Find out everybody in the market. And when I say everybody, I mean everybody. So when I started, I knew I wanted to be a television reporter and eventually an anchor. So, and because I was an Air Force brat, you know, my dad was in the Air Force for most of my life. I moved all over. So I didn't care where I lived. That's why moving to Des Moines, Iowa was not a big deal in that I've lived everywhere. I moved every two or three years. So, yes. so, so for me, I looked at all the places that had, you know, like small markets. And I sent my resume to all of those small market places, all of them, East coast, West coast, Midwest, everywhere. And then saw what's, you know, found out what stuck. And, you know, a, a headhunting agency from uh, the Des Moines area, if you guys remember Frank Magid, someone from Frank Magid called me and that's how I got that job. But for you, you want to stay in Tampa. And what, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a storyteller? Do you want to be a voiceover? I have, uh, my, what I have in goal is um, to, uh, it's commercial and mostly on merchandising. Um, and I see a lot of companies have packages of film, like video clip and imagery of a yeah. merchandise, mostly clothing. So yeah, you have uh, to find a company, maybe, like a production company. Because you have to find nothing. all the places. And, and here's another way to do that. So if you've seen a commercial or a video clip 
or a print ad or something that you like and you want to work for them because you like their work, well, you got to find out who they are. Like at the end of the video, look and see if it says the production company or who it was produced by. And then you go and Google and you find out their information and you either call them or you send them stuff. So it's not easy. I'm not going to sit here and give you 10 companies because it's not me. Who no, wants no, no. I, just, I want no, those no, no, no. keyboards and, and, and no, no, no. I'm, what I'm saying is you, you, you know yourself. So yes. you, you know what you want to do. So it's incumbent on you to find the companies who do what you want to do and then reach out to them. That would be my recommendation for anybody, for anybody. That's the thing is what we are training you for here, the video, it's not just, I know what it's all this new stuff, but you guys can go anywhere. Like lawyers need video. Yep. Um, you know, like, like I said, people who want video of their kids playing baseball so they can have a, like a, sizzle reel so they can get recruited mm -hmm. from college. There are people that want wedding video. There are people mm -hmm. like lawyer companies that, you know, like companies like a restaurant that just wants video to put on their social media. Gregory video. Stafford. Video was my, That was a big old yawn. I didn't need to see that. <laughs> my bad, my bad. I'm outside. The kid, the kids in the house sleep. I'm outside. I'll, I'll let you slide. Go ahead. I'm sorry okay, for interrupting. Let's go to the next question. Who has another question for Diane? <laughs> Christopher Seagrass, one of our graduating students. He's at the tail end of HCC. What do you hey. have for him? <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, so I was watching the basketball video package and I noticed there were quite a bit of graphics in it. And I was wondering what other things do you feel like make video packages interesting? So that, that story was interesting too because when I initially envisioned it I wanted it to not have any track that's what I wanted to do I wanted to use like a bunch of her sound and basketball sound but I ended up having to you know use some track but I had in my mind I because we were there at a certain time I wanted the time I wanted to know what time what basket how many baskets and actually the photographer and I thought about that <laughs> He thought we didn't need all that. That was, you know, he didn't want to put all those graphics over his beautiful video. So <laughs> we argued about, and reporters and photographers are always arguing about things, and that's how the best product gets done. But there were things in that that had nothing to do with me. Some of it was my vision, and he and I worked together a lot. He, I call him my work husband. And so I can tell him my vision, and he can disagree with my vision, and Usually, if he disagrees with my vision, he uh, vehemently will tell me so, and then he will do something, but I trust him enough that he will do something to make it better. So like my favorite thing he did in that piece, there was a shot where she does like that and it goes like that. I thought that was really cool. And then I forgot a couple of other things he did. Um, he made her wear a GoPro, he wore a GoPro. So, you know, you just try to do more than is necessary and then cull it all down. But, it, you know, and especially since people are going to be watching on, you know, Twitter or Instagram or YouTube or something, like I like to put a little bit of something. I should do more of that. Uh, I, I would say I'm not proficient at that, but in that one, I think it worked. And like, I wanted the baskets when she made them. And he's like, no one's gonna know what, what basket it is. I go, I'm gonna know. So when I, we said it was the 500th basket, it was her 500th basket. So, you know, anything you can do to make it, like to bump it up another notch. And I think sometimes it's graphics, sometimes it's natural sound, um, sometimes it's music, you know, it's different things that can bump it up. Okay, thank you, Chris. Next question. I have a question. Gianino. Gianino is down, the, well, for me, he's down there. Hey, G. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead and ask your question. Are you at work? Is that why you have a mask on? <laughs> he's at work. He's zooming while he's at work. <laughs> he made sure he could talk to you while he was at work. Okay, G, what's your question for me? Um, so, what was the hardest part of being a radio anchor? Right. Yeah, Max. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of aspiring radio hosts here. They have their own radio shows on Hawk Radio. See, that's so cool. When I was in college, I was not doing stuff like that. I literally was not. Well, I was working in radio. What am I saying? 
one thing I forgot to tell you, I'm so stupid sometimes. One thing I did forget to tell you is when I was in high school, I was in theater in high school, but I also worked at a radio station when I was in high school because um, I did a radio show, a 15 minute radio show on my, I, went, I lived in a really small town in Georgia and there were only two radio stations and there were only two high schools and each high school had a radio show, a 15 minute radio show on one of the radio stations. And so me and another guy, we uh, co-hosted this show. Someone heard my voice at the radio station and they, and they offered me a job. So I worked there um, right when I got out of high school. And my first job in radio was as a country music DJ, black lady. And my, and my Korean boyfriend was also on air. And we used to joke all the time, like, oh, if those guys could see us, they probably would be not okay with that or shocked or whatever. But that was my first job as a country music uh, disc jockey. Um, so I worked in radio in high school and I worked in radio in college. I worked as a DJ, I've worked in news, I've done a little bit of everything. So to me, the hardest thing is trying to find your voice and be um and be factual and accurate and truthful like it's easy to tell the facts of the story but sometimes you want to be interesting if you can but you have to be careful in how you're interesting that you're not editorializing that's the hardest thing for me no it's not really hard because i've been doing it's not hard because i've been doing news for so long so to me being factual and giving both sides really isn't hard um so that's not a fair, that's really, I lied to myself. What is hard about my job? See, I've been doing, see, I did radio, then I went to TV, and now I'm back doing radio and TV. What's hard? For my, my specific job is get, finding all of the news. Okay, so when I work at SiriusXM and when I work at Voice of America, when I work at SiriusXM, I'm usually working at two channels uh, an hour, and they're two-minute updates. So you have to know everything that's going on. Like I usually am on the baseball channel and the NFL channel. So you have to know back when there was sports, you have to know everything that's going on in all the games. So it's hard to keep up with everything. Like if you're living in the Tampa Bay area, you're probably doing talk radio about just the Bucks or the Rays or whatever the season is. But imagine you have to know all the teams, all the sports, everything that's happening in all the games and be able to concisely say what is happening and then put it in a two minute update and record it and upload it. I mean, you gotta record it, record it, upload it. So that's hard. At Voice of America, I have to know everything that's going on in the world news wise. Now we have access to tons of wires. I mean, all the news is right there, but I have to look at it all. I have to look at Reuters. I have to look at AP. I have to look at all these, I have to look at the Voice of America stuff. I have to look at, so every hour, you know, I do my update from, you know, top of the hour to five after when I'm done and I'm looking at all the wires, looking out because I'm like fearful of, oh, I don't want to miss anything. You know, I don't want to miss updating a story or I don't want to miss a big story or whatever. So trying to, for me specifically, having to know all of the, the most important stories from every country, that's hard because this isn't just for the United States of America, it's for the world. So that would be for me specifically. But I do think you have to know yourself and find your voice and not try to be somebody else. I think a lot of women in sports try to sound like a man. They try to be, hey, you know, they try to sound like a man. Or if you admire somebody on the radio, you want to be like them. Don't want to be like them. Want to be like yourself. So I would say that might be the hardest at your age because you're not sure who you are and what your voice is. I have a question again. How do we, how do these students, because mo most of them have radio shows or had radio shows, how do they take their radio shows at, ho at hawkradio.primostream.com and turn it into a job? Like tell them what the steps would be. How would they go to Sirius and say, I want to apply, here are some of my best shows. How do you get a job in radio? What that's they not, how, well, for Sirius XM, that's not how it would work. Okay. But what, what, because for Sirius XM, you have to go online. That's literally what you do, have to do. It doesn't matter if you know someone. And in fact, how I got hired at SiriusXM, I applied online. A former student of mine who worked there in traffic said, oh, they're looking for update anchors. You would be good, Diane. I applied for a job. I did upload my resume. And, and that was like on a Wednesday or a Thursday or something. And then on that weekend, uh, that Friday, I was at um, 
a restaurant bar down the street from me with, and with a friend, and she knew some people who worked at SiriusXM. They happened to be all these sports guys. A couple of them I knew. Actually, you guys know Ronnie Night Train Lane? He works in Tampa now. Anyway, he used to work here. And so I met them. I was hanging out with them. And I was told them, oh, I just applied for this job at SiriusXM. Put in a good word for me. And that was on the weekend. So on Monday, I got a call from SiriusXM. And I was like, yeah, it's who you know. Woo! And so when the, when the guy called me, and I was like, oh, I guess Chris, blah, 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 or Ronnie. But he's like, well, no, we saw your resume online. That's how it works. So that's the one of the few times where knowing somebody didn't matter. I think who you know can matter a lot. Right. So if you want, if you're trying to work at SiriusXM, please go online, look at the jobs they have, and apply online. If it's a really big company, go to their website, apply online. And then after that, if you know people who work there, or if you know someone who knows someone who works there, get an introduction whatever happens so that somebody can pluck your resume out of all those other ones. Because especially now, everybody has a podcast. Everybody's got a radio show, right? So you have to distinguish yourself. And sometimes it's who you know. That might not be fair. That might, you know, you think to yourself, but I work so hard and I've got all this experience and, you know, I've had all this stuff to show you. And it's not fair, but that's kind of how life is. So, you know, that's why every single person you meet, you know, write down their contact info, you know, get hooked up with them on LinkedIn, and then you can see the connections. And you can see, oh, I'm trying to get a job there. They know someone there. You know, I've, I've helped people that way. Um, so I don't know on a larger scale, SiriusXM or some bigger entity, you know, you probably wouldn't just take your stuff to them you would apply online. Locally, I think you have to find somebody. That, that would be my recommendation. You have to find somebody who'll give you an introduction. You can always send your stuff, send an email. Um, and the other thing I say to, to students too is um, try to build a relationship with somebody at a place where you'd like to work. You know, maybe you want to follow them on Twitter or send them a direct message or send them an email and say, man, I love your work. I've been following you for a while. And then like every, you know, five or six months, hey, I, was, I heard you say such and such the other day. That was really cool. You're not trying to, you know, write a novel to them. You know, you're not trying to be their best friend. But if you keep contact with them on an irregular basis, you know, every five, six months or something, then they're going to remember you. And I actually got a job that way. I used to send emails to all these people on my, that I had emails for about when I would do a story that I was really proud of. Hey, this is the latest story I did. Blah, blah, blah. And, I, and this guy who I'd met at this uh, sports function party once, he remembered me and he wrote me back and he's like, Diane, I love that story. That was great. He goes, that reminds me, I'm about to work on this project you'd be perfect for. And I did like four or five projects for him where I got to do things like, uh, there was this event called the Sneaker Ball where all the athletes who were anybody in DC were there and they were fundraising for some charity and everyone wore sneakers and, you know, formal wear up top and then sneakers. And I got to interview everybody. Uh, so I got to do a lot of fun things like that. And that was because I had sent an email. So my name was kind of in his brain. You know, I didn't know him well but he saw my work, he remembered me, I'd met him at a party. So if you can build some sort of relationship or be in some position where you can have people remember you, that's really helpful. What, what should they have on their, when they're doing radio, what should they, what's their stuff that they're sending on their online application? Like what's this, is it like three, show, three of their best shows? Well, I don't know, I've never had to do that. Oh, because <laughs> she's so, so like when I applied at SiriusXM, they didn't ask for any of my work. You just okay. fill out the thing the and, they, and then they do research on you. And actually at SiriusXM, that process was really, really long. So it was at Voice of America too, for different reasons. But um, it was a really long months. Uh, I think it was like, like three or four months before I worked at SiriusXM because I had to go through all this long process. And at Voice of America, I interviewed the last week of August and I didn't start till the last week of January. Okay, what's I have a question. Mm -hmm. Who's got the question? Kendra? Kendra? 
Yes, my that's a um, my quarter there, Kendra. <laughs> say that again, Nerissa. Say that again. She's Kendra is like an she. She's an aspiring reporter. She's considering being a reporter. Got it. Um, so my question for you was, what made you want to start your own broad broadcasting company? And I guess does that function the same way that like a film production company would work? Yes, it's it, yes. I consider myself a production company. I mean, I it's me, myself, and I. I am Diane's talking. So I hire different people to work for me. Um, so what? made me want to do my have my own business is um so when i was in tampa i kept getting passed over for monday through friday jobs and then i ended up leaving there came here worked uh freelance at the fox affiliate for almost eight years and um that was a situation where i i i auditioned to be a weekend sports anchor and uh, they liked me and they and they hired me, but not as staff, just as freelance. So as a freelance um, weekend sports anchor, which was which was fine. But then when they were ready to hire a staff um, sports anchor, they they hired a guy, and then he was there for a while, and then he was kind of a shady dude, and they ended up having to fire him. And I said, hey, I'd like to be considered uh, for this next go round again. Can I be considered? Oh yes, you, of course you can be considered. Okay, is there anything I need to do or work on? And I crap you not, there was a comment about my hair, but I moved on and I just worked as hard as I could have And then they hired another guy and who also got fired uh, after a couple of years and I was still there working. So um, I decided, okay, uh, for whatever reason, I'm getting passed over at different places for whatever reason. So why don't I put myself in control of my destiny as much as I can? So by the way, you moved, there you are over there. Um, you were here and then you moved. Um, so that was part of the reason I wanted to start my own thing. Um, it was hard and I'm not great at it, but I have gotten some gigs and I also consider all of the stuff I do for everyone because I'm not staff anywhere. I am freelance everywhere I work, Voice of America, Sirius XM, I'm not staff. So I consider all of that under the umbrella of Diane's talking. So for me, it's about me having control of when and where I work and what kind of work I do and who I do it with. So if there's a company who wants to hire me and maybe I find their mission statement distasteful, I can choose if I want to not work with them. When you're younger and you're just starting out, I don't think those sorts of decision, decisions are as easy to make because you're trying to gain experience and get experience and get the work and establish yourself in the industry. So for me, that's uh, what it's about. And I just want to say one thing. Nerissa and I are the exact same person. She cannot help herself. She wants to talk so much. Well, no, because the only, you have a line the only person who wants to talk more than her is me. But go ahead. A, you have you have more people wanting to ask you questions. I'm, I'm just trying to answer the question. Okay, so Shania is wait, it Shania? Or Shania? Wait, 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 okay, wait, okay. wait. Kendra, did I answer your question? Okay. Yes. No. I because um, I blab a lot, and sometimes I go off on tangents. I just need to make sure I give you some. Okay. Go ahead, Nuri. Love the idea of. Um, you know, starting your own production company or like, I mean, I know I have a lot of friends who might've started their own um, mm -hmm. like channels or what, because they don't get the opportunities yeah. for what so they, you know, their, you know, into their own hands. And so like, I love hearing, you know, that yeah. more and more people are doing that. In the film industry, Reese Witherspoon and Carrie Washington did it and they've got tons of work. Anywho. Kendra, I'm not going to bring it up. <laughs> Thank God. I'll tell you something interesting about Kendra later. Okay. Okay, so uh, Shania, Shania. Is it Shania or Shania? No, it's Shania, you're right. Shania, Are you named after Shania Twain? Shania, yeah, like, can Twain. we see you, Shania? I don't see you. Are oh. you on camera? Yeah, I'm in the car. Oh, okay. Hi, Are you named after Shania Twain? <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. Oh, wait, now she's on camera. There she's she is. driving to work. Be careful. Okay. What's your question for Diane? Okay, so my question is, when they didn't renew your contract in Tampa, did you feel discouraged after that? Because when you were talking about it, it seemed like 
it was really hard for you. So how did you like succeed after that? Like what motivated you not to give up? Right. The theme is failure is not, right? Yeah. Failure is not always a bad thing. And that wasn't a failure. Thor. Right. So I loved working at Channel 8. It was like my family. And I did some of my best work at Channel 8. Um, and I really liked working there. But I did not like um, that the whole time I was there, I only got to work weekends because I thought I was better than that. And there's, a, there's a, an adage in television that people of color mostly work on weekends and it's called the weekend ghetto. And so my whole goal was always to get out of the weekend ghetto. Right? Uh huh. Right? So it didn't work. And um, things transpired there where my lawyer, because I didn't have an agent, my lawyer was negotiating the contract with the news director. And they finally came to an agreement. My contract was up in August. They finally came to an agreement in February. That's like six months later. And they didn't want to give me retroactive pay, which is common in the industry. That's like standard in the industry. However long you're negotiating, you're negotiating in good faith and you go back to that point. And they refused to go back to that point to give me retroactive pay. They were only going to give me retroactive pay to January. So like for a month and a half, that's a lot of money. And I didn't think it was fair. And I thought that they were playing games because that's what companies do because they're trying to they're trying to make money <laughs> and they're trying to, you know, they don't want to pay people as much as they're trying not to, they're trying to pay people the least amount they can to get the most out of them. I mean, that's what all companies do. That's not just TV stations. You know, they're trying to make the biggest profit possible. So I didn't think it was fair. My feelings were hurt, but I was also upset that um, that I felt like all the control was somewhere else besides within me. And so I told my lawyer, I said, well, I want to quit. And he goes, okay. And I said, I'm really so angry. I'd like to quit um, today. It was a Friday and I would have been anchoring on that Saturday. I would like to quit today, but I'm not going to. He's like, don't do that. Give him two weeks. I'm like, of course, that's the kind of person I am. I gave him two weeks. My news director didn't believe I was quitting because he called me right after my lawyer called him. And so... I just had to bet on myself. I had never done that in my life. So I had to bet on myself, which was I quit that job without having another job, not knowing where I was going to live or what I was going to do or where I was going to work. So, so that, so I bet on myself and I persevered. And I think the fact that I've always had to work harder than somebody else, or I, that's not true. Like a, a lot of people work hard. I'm not trying to say other people don't work hard, but yeah. you know, I had to work extra hard as a Brown person and as a woman and as a woman in sports, don't get me started. So I just had to bet on myself. So, you know, I left Tampa, I moved here and I didn't know how long I was going to be here. And I'm here 20 years later and I've loved almost every minute of it, but I don't like being passed over. I, I, I am motivated by fairness. Like, heavily motivated by fairness in all things I do. Right. So I feel as though I wasn't being treated fairly. And when I left the Fox affiliate, I felt as though I wasn't being treated fairly. Like I was there to be the weekend anchor. I was good enough to do it until they hired a guy and then they fired him. And then I wasn't good enough to get the next job. And then they hired a guy and then they fired him. And I still wasn't good enough to get that job. So I, so I am motivated by that. Like I don't take that as, um, oh, well, I wasn't good enough. I take it as you're wrong. I'm going to make you pay. I'm going to show you. So that's sort of, I hope that answered your question. I think that it's also like, it sounds cliche, but when one door opens, you can like, when mm -hmm. one door closes or like she wasn't getting her way, whether you're not getting a contract re-signed or they're not giving you what you want and dreamed of, mm -hmm. you can fall on the floor. You have to like, again, make it happen, Rainmaker. Yeah. You can fall on the floor and yep. go, oh my God, I, I'm yep. horrible. Or you can just keep moving and prove everyone wrong. And that's what Diane has done. Yeah. She has got, come so far since that position. Had yeah. she been like Shania, like shut the door and just say like, oh my God, I'm so discouraged. They, oh, are, the ball, they, they I, define I, me. They define me. They didn't, re, you know, they didn't, they don't want to make me a Monday through Friday anchor. If she just stopped there, 
it would have ended there. She would just have been bitter for once. And this yes. Was something. You have to, yeah. okay, that door closes. God ha it happened for a reason. There's something else. Yeah. And you keep right. my whole thing, like Diane, because we're twins, prove everyone wrong. And yeah. look, I think she's a multimedia sister woman. So. I mean, I do a ton of stuff, and I'm in, living in the nation's capital, which is crazy. Um, you know, it's, it's not better. always easy. You know, and there are there are there are a lot of slow times. As a freelancer, there are a lot of slow times. Keep that in mind. But I would rather have these slow times and be eating peanut butter and jelly, you know, for a couple weeks than be in a situation where I'm not wanted or where I don't feel I'm wanted or where I feel my talents aren't um appreciate it yeah but or that's important okay we let's we're gonna take a couple more questions so um i have a question Manny's i have one right after, well, I have so one right after Gregory, him. They're, they're fighting over questions now diane i have one right after him manny was raising his hand like, i'll be next oh, oh. and then that, oh, I, <laughs> we have to take more than two okay manny what's your question okay let me go just quick before they call me okay so um i'm gonna go in the helicopter yeah they're breaking so, news breaking news not yet but they they might, so I, I just want to get this out before they call me. So, um, you said that uh, you own your own business. So, how long did it take you to build up your own business or your own company? Um, or not company, uh, your... I'm still building it. <laughs> oh. I mean, I started my business in 2008, but you know, so since that time, working for like I said, everything I do, I feel like is under that umbrella. So, my work at Voice of America, my work at WUSA Nine, my work at SiriusXM, everything is under that umbrella. And also the things I do for other companies and the voiceover work I do and the media training I do, it's all under that one umbrella to me. Sometimes Diane's talking and Diane Roberts are intertwined. So I still like, I feel like I'm still building it up. You know, I still meet people and I'm constantly telling them about what I do. I think the hardest thing for me now is and I, if I'd done it better in 2008, I might be in a different position, but I didn't really understand how important it was to market myself. Like, cause I thought, well, I've been doing this so long and I, I've shown myself to be proficient at it. I've, you know, been Emmy nominated a zillion times. I've won a Murrow. I just won a telly a couple weeks ago. And you know, I feel like, okay, you know, I've established myself, um, but that doesn't mean anything if people don't know. So marketing myself, that's the thing that I've had to do over the years that I didn't realize I needed to do, that I wasn't good at, that I'm better at now, but I still need to be even better, if okay. that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Gregory, and then uh, after Gregory is, is uh, wait, who was next? Sharon. So Gregory, what's your question for Diane? My question is, uh, what advice would, would you give, if you could go back, what advice would you tell, tell yourself 20 years ago that would be applicable to all of our lives? Ooh, <laughs> question. Okay, let me think about this. Uh, I have a question oh, afterwards. Uh, you, know what I would you know what I would say is, um, don't believe the narrative that other people set up for you. Don't believe the stories that other people may say about you. And for me, that would be, you know, um, that would be, you know, oh, you don't read teleprompter well. Or when I was in Des Moines and I, and I asked if I could do some anchoring. And when I lived in Des Moines and I was only there two years and eight months, I went through three news directors and three general managers in that time frame. That's an awful lot. And that was my first job. So, you know, you're seeing all these crazy things. And so um, I went to one of the news directors and I wanted to do some fill-in anchoring. And he says, have you looked at yourself in the mirror lately? So like now I would tell that person, oh, right. sue them, yeah, sue them. Like you can't say that to a person. But I was in my twenties, what did I know? Uh, you know, I'm, I, okay, yes, I'm black and I'm in a place that's mostly white and okay, you know, I don't deserve to be on TV, sorry. Well, that's wrong. That was the wrong narrative for him to, to give me and the wrong narrative for me to accept. So I would say, don't believe the narrative that other people place on you, which I think is really, really hard because there's a fine line between confidence and being, um, you know, like overly being cocky. There's a fine line between confidence and cocky. So you have to be confident. You always have to be open to learn. You always have to be open to learning and growing and meeting people and getting better at your craft. I mean, I get better at my craft all the time by listening to other people and watching other people and 
you know, I actually have a women's group I started and we're all, almost all of us are women who used to be in television. We're all now freelance. We have one woman who's an executive coach um, and we all meet and every, you know, I don't know, couple months and we talk about what's happening in the industry and how we can get better and how we can improve ourselves. So even though we've all been doing this for a long time. So, so don't believe the narrative and always be open to getting better every single day and, and meet as many people as you can and stay in contact with as many people as you can. Not annoyingly so, <laughs> just. I like that irregularly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, Sharon, thank you, Greg. Sharon, you got, you're, you're on the line. I feel like caller, you're on the line. What's your question for Diane? I'm listening. Uh, I have a call. I have a question. Okay, afterwards, Malcolm. Thank you. Okay. okay, go ahead, Sharon. Malcolm's next. My question for you basically is, I'm very interested in doing a lot of things, you know, the voiceovers, the radio, broadcasting, and um, sometimes I doubt myself and, and like in the terms of, you know, what degree to pursue and what school to go to oh. and what if I say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. And I've even had people tell me, you know, you should relax your hair because it's too curly and it's mm. not professional. Mm. So mm. you kind of cut that in a sense where you're talking about how colorism and um, being female as well has, you know, affected you mm -hmm. and also giving into the narrative that other people set for you. Mm -hmm. So my question is like, where do where do you find the confidence to not let people belittle, belittle you and make you feel like you're not good enough to be part of that community? And also, do you also agree with the term, um, it doesn't matter where you start, just get your foot in the door and just do whatever it is that they can offer you at the moment? So those are all good questions. I actually spoke to um, some students doesn't matter. Well, I just spoke to some students last week too, and very similar question came up, or a couple weeks ago, some University of Tampa students about, you know, not allowing people to belittle me or whatever. I think that just comes from years of knowing yourself. And I'm a very confident person, and I'm an outgoing person. You know, I'm an extrovert and all those things, and those things serve me well. But I have feelings, and I'm very very sensitive. So I wasn't able to walk that fine line for a long time. You know, I just believed it. I did. So it's not easy. You just have to, I mean, I, there, there's self-help books out there for a reason. You know, I, you know, there, there used to be an old sketch on Saturday Night Live, this character named Stuart Smalley, and he would look in the mirror and go, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And back then we thought that was hilarious and ah, but it's like now I'm like telling yourself that you're enough and you're worth it and you're good and you're worthy. Like those things matter. Those things help. So, and I think you should surround yourself with people who believe in you too. So those are the only things I, I can say. I, I don't think it's an easy road. I think it's hard, but I think it's worth all of the work that you would put into it. So you just have to start now. Like I started much later. I mean, I had this drive and I had this motivation and I thought I had talent and skill, but there were still moments where I let that narrative sort of keep me down. And I just don't, I don't allow that anymore. What about but what I learned. Okay. I'm sorry. What about what she said about taking any job you can get? Oh yeah, I well, I would say I would say yes and no. There's a guy who used to be an intern at Channel Nine when I worked there, the the CBS affiliate, and he was on the floor crew, and he wanted his dad was a photographer, a longtime ABC News photographer, and he wanted to be a reporter so bad. He was so green, and he would stay after, and he would like he would pick the brain of the reporters and the anchors, and he would go out with people on stories and everything. He's now working in Boston. And this has been, he went from DC as a floor crew guy to some other little market and then to Miami and then to Boston. As talent. As yeah. Right now. So, you know, I would say, <laughs> yes, take something where you just to get your foot in the door, but be careful that you don't get pigeonholed into staying in that place. That's the only thing. So just be careful of, 
if you get in there and you're the greatest floor director ever, they're not ever going to see you as anything else. So you have to remind them. You have to go out on stories. You have to pick people's brain. You have to write your own stories and you're not getting paid for it. And then give it to a reporter and say, how does this look? And then they can critique it for you. And then they can help you. And that's how you get better. You have to have mentors. You really, all of you have to have mentors. I mean, then I think you, that starts when you, um, when you get an internship. Or at HCC. That's why I have this broadcast mentor series. Oh, okay, so, yeah. Matt, hey, wait, I'm taking a up. picture. Everybody. Yes. Oh, wait. I'm going to take a picture too. So you have one. Pick, you are you going to take a screenshot? I, I've been taking pictures, but let's all smile. Because I want you to know, a friend of mine, I did a Zoom thing with her mentees the other day, and she uh -huh. took a screenshot, and I was like, that's even smarter. But everyone take, all right, everyone smile. If you take a picture, then I'll take a picture. Everyone, non-video participants, get on. Smile. <laughs> okay, let me take my picture. Everyone smile. Diane, smile. You know I'm going to text this to you and see if you, you said You said Diane, smile, and I was like, I'm smiling. <laughs> Three, two, one. Smile. Okay, let me take it without the kit. Three, two, one. Okay, got it. Okay. Hey, we're going to question. more questions now because we're, we're, it's getting long. So I'm sorry that you guys have all the, I, I said, you guys better come with questions. They all have questions now. That's good. So, um, yeah, so Next. above and beyond. Okay, let's, let's get, um, I think Malcolm has been patient right. and waiting. He's been wanting to ask you for a long time. Keeps going Thank you, time. Malcolm, for your patience. Oh, you're welcome. So you've done television and radio. Which one did you honestly say that you find like the most enjoyment in? I would say both, but I would say television because you get to be more creative. So you get, you have the layers because you have the words and the pictures. And so for me, I like weaving the words and the pictures together and have maybe starting a story here and then telling him and coming back and finishing in that same place or maybe telling a timeline or telling the story out of order, starting with the big thing and then like, wait, how do we get there? And then telling it that way. There's so many different ways to tell a story. And so that, so that's why I like television. Okay. Eric agrees with me. That's why I like <laughs> television. But the thing I like about radio, now, even though I'm working from home, when I get up, I get up, I take a shower, I do my hair, I do my makeup. Even though I'm just walking from my bedroom there to right here. Because it's still work, it's still my job. Well, one day, I didn't. I got up late because I hit the snooze like four times. And I'm supposed to start work at six. And it was like 540 or something. I got up brushed my teeth, I ate, and then I came over here. I did my entire shift in pajamas. And I was like, I'm broadcasting to the world in my pajamas. This is awful. But it was so decadently great. So, <laughs> so in radio, I don't have to look great. <laughs> That's oh. one of the things I really like. And you know something else I do, a couple of other things I do. I do, um, I've been a correspondent for and also a field producer for a show called Matter of Fact with Soledad O'Brien. It's a nationally syndicated show. It airs in like 90% of the country. And I just yesterday was working on a story. I wanted to tell you guys this. I was, I had on Thursday had been setting up this story with this man named David Beasley. He's the head of the World Food Program, which is part of the UN, part of the United Nations. He's a very big deal. And so I was going to interview him to be part of somebody, another correspondent story. I was just picking up the interview for her here in Washington, D.C. And then, so Thursday, Friday, da, 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 and then um, the interview was yesterday, two, uh, what is today? Tuesday. Thursday. So yesterday was Wednesday. Oh, yeah. So on Tuesday, I sent an email. Okay, I hope we're ready for tomorrow. Blah, blah, blah. And I, can't, I don't know what I said. There was something I said in the email. And they're like, oh, well, I didn't know that was going to be part of the story. Maybe we shouldn't be involved. And I was like, I've been working on it since Thursday. It's not my story. It's for someone else. This is another example of like perseverance. I had to call because, you know, I could try replying, but they don't get to hear my tone. They don't get to hear my sincerity. So I had to call and leave a message. And then I had to write another email so that they could understand what I meant. It was really wild. And I also am a field producer for Entertainment Tonight sometimes. So I get to everything, with, everything. I get to interview a ton <laughs> of celebrities, and that's one of my favorite things. Too. I like celebrity reporting. See, you guys can do everything or one or two of these. Yeah, that's a, that's the beauty of our business. You're multimedia. So okay. Malcolm, that's the answer. Is I love them both. Better storytelling, different, 
but for me, better storytelling in television, but I don't have to do hair and makeup and radio if I don't want to. I think oh. we got Ruben next and then Thomas Blair. So Ruben, Ruben. Hi, okay. Um, so I, I had, I wanted to know because of, um, of main, like mainstream media and stuff like that, um, and with all the like protests and the Black Lives Matter, uh, protests that are going on. Do you think that um, the the way that people in the community accept news is going to like change significantly? Because like um, because the people on like social media and stuff, they're like posting a whole bunch of videos and saying like this is what's really happening. But then you'll turn to the news and they'll be like, well, this is something else that's completely different than what's being said on social media. Do you want to give me an example, a specific example? Because I have a couple thoughts, but I'm not sure that I completely understand what you mean. Um, like with the, like with the protest specifically, there's been like, um, like for example, Tampa, there was the, we, we've had a few protests and then there was one night where the protests were peaceful, mm -hmm. but then on the news, it was saying that the, like a riot was started because of the protesters mm. and stuff like that. Mm. But on social it's media, started. everyone was saying that nothing had happened hmm. that caused any like, um, like and, police backfire or anything like that. Okay, and so your specific question one more time, because now I have the example in my brain. Whether like whether or not the uh, community and like citizens are going to be accepting like. Oh. news from the TV and stuff the same way. So I have a lot of thoughts on this. I, I think there's a place for citizen journalism, but the problem with citizen journalism is most of the time, this is my belief. I think most of the time, a lot of times, not most, a lot of times citizen journalists have a particular agenda. And so, and they haven't been to school. They haven't taken law and ethics courses. They haven't learned, um, the value of matching your words to your pictures. And so I think sometimes people who just record things with their phone, sometimes they can be reckless because they don't understand the power they have. So I think depending on the situation, I'm, gonna, I'm going to always side with the mainstream media. I just am because I've been in it. I've worked with people, like I have to defend people all the time on my Facebook page. They're like, mainstream media is awful. They tell lies. And I'm like, all of the people I know who work at local media, who work at the national level, who work at the syndicate, they work their ass off, excuse my language, to get the story right, to get the facts right, and to tell the truthful story. So when I hear that the mainstream media is not telling the truth or they're lying, now these days, some of the media does lean a certain way, Fox does lean a certain way, MSNBC does lean a certain way. There is more of that than there used to be 20 years ago, but I just feel like there are so many working journalists trying hard to tell the truth who have been through schooling and who have been through experiences who are able to couch what they are seeing and hearing in their wealth of experience, that I'm going to take that information over somebody who's out you know, and maybe is only getting part of the story. That, and I'm not saying there's not value in citizen journalism because there is, but to me, and I could be hearing you wrong, it almost sounds like an either or. You know, I prefer they work, you know, together, but I don't always, I, I wish citizen journalists understood the power they have. You know, when they put things up on media, like we had a situation, I'll tell it real fast, there was a, and you probably saw it because it went national. There was a man on a bike, uh, riding on a bike trail. He saw people putting up flyers for George Floyd protest. He was a white man. They were young white people. He thought they were kids. They were actually in like 18 or 19. They were just really small. And he was very, very aggressive. He went up in their face. He grabbed the the flyers, what are you doing? What are you doing? And the what the guys like videotaping it, like what leave her alone, what are you doing? And he was like total like road rage. And then he takes his bike and he goes and he runs over the guy who's taking the video and knocks him down. 
and the whole thing. And so everyone was looking for this guy, right? So everyone's putting his, that video and his picture up on social media. Let's find this guy. Who is this guy? We got to find this guy. I retweeted it. We got to find this guy. Well, what happened was a lot of people thought they knew him and they started putting names out. You don't get to just put somebody's name out there. That doesn't happen in the mainstream media very often. If it does, it's a mistake. It doesn't happen very often because they're gonna find out who it is before they just go spouting some random name. That's where citizens journalists have a, a problem. And so there were people who got hate mail, hate letters, uh, got calls from the police because they were identified. Well, it wasn't them. So that's where social media goes wrong. They don't have those checks and balances. They just say whatever they want, whenever they want. So that's my biggest gripe about social media. Okay, thank you. Was that helpful? Yeah, because it sometimes like, um, it's, it's like you don't know who to yeah. believe. Yeah, I get that. Because yeah. you want to believe what you see, but what if you haven't seen it all? And exactly. what if your yeah. agenda is, exactly. you just don't know. They don't, they're not people like regular people. You guys are now training to be professionals. The people who are amateur on the street, they're not getting paid or have a boss to say, did you get the other side of the story yeah. to get it right? What Diane is saying that when, what you guys are being trained for is to be what we always talk about, credible source. Mm -hmm. You have to have a credible source and somebody's going to hold you accountable. If, if we just tell one side, even that biker, they're going to make me try to get the other side, like a family member or something. Mm -hmm. People who just randomly recklessly post as she says they don't have nobody they're just going to post what they want to see nobody's going to nobody's down their neck to tell them the other side of the story and, and lives are are harmed by that yeah, by that that's right so i hope you are all responsible with they are. Going. they're being trained to okay thomas blair you're next he's in our broadcast yeah. news class so he's taking broadcast news and i did get your script I have to get through it because I'm doing 20, I just did 20 high school scripts. That was kind of nutty. So. Okay. <laughs> okay, Thomas, you're up. Okay, uh, so hello. Uh, so I've got a question about talk radio, specifically like talk radio. So, you know. News podcasts. or sports or does it matter? Hmm? News or sports or does it matter? When you say it talk does, radio. It doesn't matter. I'm just like okay. talk radio in general. Like, okay. You know. Uh, so, you know, we're living in a time where podcasts are really popular, you know, it, it, it's kind of similar to talk radio, except, uh, you know, it's internet based and it's on demand and you can choose like what you want to listen to fast forward, we want and stuff like that. Uh, I was once told when I was trying to get, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do from like my degree. And I was talking about, you know, doing talk radio. I was told by an advisor, I think, that radio and talk radio is kind of dying out because of podcasts. And she told me that if you're going to go for something like that, you might not want to do traditional talk radio. You might want to do something like, you know, podcasts or something like that. And as someone who's been in this business for so many years, what do you think about that? Should you c continue doing uh it like traditional talk radio if you wanted to or should you go for like podcasts or something like that since i'll tell you something that people don't always think about when they think about podcasts because i know plenty of people who do podcasts yeah and i'll give you an example of two different people i know so i have a friend who used to be a, a correspondent on good morning america and then after that she worked for dr oz and she um, started a podcast. So think about the cachet that that person has, right? She's worked at the network level, worked on Good Morning America, worked for Dr. Oz. And there was a, a company in town, a radio station, like a radio station owner who was starting this podcast division. And so she has all of this cachet and they had trouble getting, um, getting sponsorship. So you can do a podcast if you want. But what is your goal for the podcast? I'm guessing you want to disseminate information and then make money off of that. I mean, I'm guessing you want to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to make money off of it, podcast away. I have nothing to say and you can do whatever you like and it, and it wouldn't be a problem. But most people are working to make a living. And that includes people who are doing podcasts. They want to make money. So 
you have to get sponsors and it is hard as hell. So my friend who started it, uh, her podcast, she eventually, she put in so much of her own money to do things to provide like video elements for her podcast, for people to go to the website and see and all, I mean, it, the information was amazing and, and that podcast couldn't survive because they couldn't get enough sponsorship. So, um, and then I have another friend who used to work here in DC and then went to Cleveland and now is in San Francisco and covered the 49ers and the Warriors and that whole thing, blah, blah, blah. And he started a podcast. It took him years um, to get sponsorship, but he ended up paying a company that helps you get sponsorship for your podcast. So it wasn't like he just found them on his own. So if you wanna do it to make money, you have to find sponsorship and because everybody and their brother's doing podcasts, it's very hard. You have to have some sort of uh, pre-established resume. But my friend did and still couldn't get enough sponsorship to keep her. You know what sponsorship is, going. Thomas? Like you have to get somebody like pay, you do commercials. You do the commercials, yes. right? For them. Yeah, I know what sponsorship yeah, yeah, is. Think, yeah. You buy our sponsors and then they give yeah. you thousands of dollars. If you just want to do a podcast just because you think it would be fun, fine. It doesn't matter then. But then you're like, who's going to listen? You have to, you, you got to build up a, a, a listenership, right? How are you going to do that? And you might be able to do it on your own and it'd be great. That's the, uh, that's another thing. If you're someone who has like a ton of followers on Twitter and Instagram, then you can show that you have followers. Then you can go to sponsors and say this many people, and then you can get sponsorship. But it's what I have found from all my friends who've tried and failed and tried and succeeded. That's really, really, really hard. And Thomas, okay. I don't know who that advisor was or what they know about the business. I'm assuming that they don't really. So, I mean, I mean, again, like with the narrative, anything can be done. I mean, it could be dumb luck. It could be, you know, you, you try it. Don't let anyone tell you don't try it because you probably won't, you'll never make it because it's dying. You just try it until you're sick of trying it and then move on to something else. But I think for all of you, for all of you, if you can, I think it's really important to be clear in your mind what it is you want to do. Now you might not know right this second because you're, you're young, but you need to, as, as soon as you can, you need to crystallize what it is you're trying to do. And then you have to take steps to reach that goal. So Thomas, if your goal is, I just want to talk about politics and that's all you want to do. And you don't care if 10 people listen or 10,000, go for it and you'll be happy. But if your goal is, I want to talk about politics or sports or consumerism or whatever it is, and I want to build a huge base and I want to make money and I want to be a brand, you've got to, if you know that, you've got to do steps to get there. So you have to know yourself. All of you have to know what it is you want to do and figure out the steps are to get there. Okay. Yeah. I I think we are going on a two hour Zoom. I mean, I thank you everybody for asking questions and- um, Well, I can go two hours. I mean, you're paying me so much hours. money. It's so <laughs> worth it. I'm kidding. But you guys, I want to, everyone, let's thank Diane. <laughs> thank you. Turn off your mic. Thank you. Turn off your mic. Let's clap. I thank want to see you. all the mics off. Take off your microphone. Take, Rebecca, take off your microphone. Take off your microphone. George Ritchie, take off your microphone. Everyone give Diane a hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, Diane, you are officially I'm putting you I'm putting you on blast now. You are officially their broadcast mentor. Is that okay? Yep. So they may email you irregularly like oh. you like you you said you advised them to. They may email you irregularly to get so, advice. So here's a couple things. Here's my email address. So there you go. Write it down. This is like getting the business card. You want this. Here is, this is me on LinkedIn. It's on, chat. it's on chat if you can look at it. Look in your chat, D. Roberts. How do you click chat? Oh, click on the bottom of the screen. It says chat. You'll see like a number. Look on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Oh, yeah. 